What do you mean? Linux doesn't have limits. So, what's Linux 1? Unleash it how, exactly? How big is big? Doesn't that slow applications down? That sounds like a lot. <laughs> wow. Well, that's... How? How many dedicated I.O. processors does a regular server have? Oh. Can it play League of Legends? But it does run Linux. Which distributions? Hypervisors? Runtimes? But will my CIO love it? If the price is right. Okay. So, how do I get one? Linux 1. All right, guys, look. Thank you for, thank you first of all, because a lot of you have been here for a couple hours. As people are in and out, right? But, you know, this, this, this moment in time in OpenStack is, I think, truly amazing. Because, you know, when we, as a community, got together and started OpenStack as a foundation back in 2011, 2012. Uh, there was a small number of us who actually believed, right? And then folks uh, kind of came together and created, frankly, you know, a lot of people think of it as a, as a, as a movement, right? To, to build the most ubiquitous infrastructure as a service open source technology. And, and we've arrived. And what's amazing is throughout the years that we've gone from, you know, hey, can we create a code base to, you know, what are clients doing with it? How can we scale it? How can we do more? How can we get the world on OpenStack, right? The world's web runs on Apache HTTP. Every web server has that, right? The world's clouds are gonna be running OpenStack, trust me, okay? And if you're not, you're gonna be left behind. So what I'd like to talk about today is Linux. Linux without limits. But what I really want to talk about is artists. <laughs> oh, you're like what? Did you just say? I want to talk about artists, artists, and what is that word, Manny? Connoisseur. 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 Artists and connoisseurs. Now, here's what we're going to do, okay? All, most of us in this room, I'm going to call artists, although some of you might be both. Artists or connoisseurs. Artists, let's think about it as technologists for a moment, okay? Developers, people who, who manage infrastructure, technology. Those are artists in this discussion. Connoisseurs are people who appreciate art, let's say. Business people, people who, who uh, want outcomes, people who like revenue, people who want to enjoy what they're looking at, okay? And in this discussion, I'm going to spend some time on artists and spend some time on connoisseurs. Because, you know, as technologists, as computer scientists, as engineers, we are artists. We really are, right? I've spent my entire career in development, writing code, teaching graduate level computer science. To me, it is an art form, okay? But you cannot be an artist if you don't have an infrastructure, okay, a palette that can be stretched and extended to hold my art form. And you cannot be an artist if you do not have colors and brushes and technology, say open source technology, to build your painting, okay? And uh, what, what is amazing about kind of the world we're in now is that as artists, we have access to so many colors and so many brushes and so many pieces of open source technology. And then the connoisseurs, the business people, the people that pay our bills, the people that's allowing you to come and, and attend these wonderful sessions, and, all, and I know you guys go out at night too, 
because I see you. Not that I go out. I have cameras. I just watch, right? But <laughs> you know, and, and pay your bills so you can come out and have a good time and, and, and co collaborate. Why do they do that? Right? They do that because they know that you will help deliver better business outcomes, right? And it's this marriage of the ability to have a palette, an infrastructure that matters, that can scale to the enterprise, scale to the workloads that you need, right? And then at the same time, allow you to have the freedom to be what? Manny? Oh, come on, an artist. <laughs> Manny's not paying attention. Minus 10 points for Manny. Hey, guys, I'm going to call on everyone here before the day's over. So now, let me draw you a, a picture. So here's the thing. There is a constant democratization of technology, right? You know, remember in the early days, we had assembly language. We had, uh, you know, boy, I love Lisp. Anyone know Lisp? You know, Object-oriented Lisp, CLOS. That's freaking amazing, right? Well, you know, we have this democratization of technology. And as you move on, you start reducing the concept count, the number of things you need to know to get stuff done, right? Your average, you know, in the web revolution, 13, 14 year old could build a website and make a ton of money. Today, your average 12 year old can write JavaScript, right? And create a transaction server with Node.js on the server. Holy cow, that's pretty amazing. Isn't that cool? Think about all that can happen. No, 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 no. Think about how scary that is. Think about 60 billion REST requests hitting a system at once written by a 12-year-old. If you run a bank, if you're, I think we got USAA in here, you know, you're running, this is a little bit scary. You need an infrastructure that can actually handle that, that can scale, that can handle that. You understand? But at the same time, you don't want to be constrained. You don't want to be constrained in terms of the pallets you use. Imagine a world where you can stand up, I don't know, 100,000 containers in a half, half a microsecond. Who can do that? We can. We can do that. We can do that with the IBM Linux One. And that is the topic we're going to get into here. So far, so good? You guys awake? Because it's real dark in here. I'm falling asleep. Now, let's talk about the pallet for a moment. Man, I love colors and I love brushes. And I certainly love open source. I mean, I've just been, this is my uh, first year at IBM, but <laughs> what's funny about that? Okay. <laughs> it's my first year at IBM. No. You know, I've been around open technology and open source for a long time. You know, I, I got to join IBM, IBM Research in, in the mid 90s. Uh, I spent a lot of time. Uh, working on the original web standards, co-authoring a lot of the web writing the first XML parser, which was actually in C. And then we had to write it in Java, because the world wanted Java. But what is amazing about this kind of renaissance 2.0 of open source, because it's very different right now than it was back then, it was much more academic, is that you all, end users, what I would consider clients, are involved in the creation of this technology. Now, what, what do you think that's going to do? Imagine, we live in a world now that is amazing, where you have an, an application on a phone, and you can transact and do something. And by the way, it's using those protocols that we built in the 90s, OK? And you know, we could not imagine that then. And we built an infrastructure not thinking about the use cases. Because the web, Sir Tim Berners-Lee built it, to disseminate physics information, the first XML Markup language the ma was the mathematical markup language. That was the use case to do compute and visualization of math. It wasn't to do a transaction system. But now, this generation of open source, we're building it to meet what it is you all, the end users, want to do. The world that we're going to live in, when you look at the confluence of cloud, right, mobile, cognitive, Internet of Things, did I just hit bingo, right? Okay, but it's true when you look at that It is going to be unbelievable things that you can do so the you know when you look at using Linux one You can use the palette of open source technology and IBM technology Which by the way is built on open source technology on the system without having to change the skills that you've got You can still be an artist Right you can still be an artist. You don't have to change the skills that you have whether it's looking at your distributions that you're using most importantly Ubuntu 
hypervisors, languages, run times, management, databases, and analytics. Now, a word on open source. Because a lot of people like to talk about open source. And that's cool. I'll be at OSCON. Anyone going to OSCON? You guys going? Kyle, are you going to go? Yes? Good. Thank you. Um, you know, and eh, very good. Thank you. Um, you know, here's the thing. When I listen to people talk about open source, I ask myself a question. Are they a leech? A leech is so, something that sucks in, but doesn't give back, right? It is real important that when you participate in open source that you give as much as you get, because that is how you build an ecosystem, right? That's how you expand something. And at IBM, that's a lesson that we certainly learned when we helped you know, push Linux along right, in the mid-90s. We have literally hundreds of developers on OpenStack, as you all know. But not just there. When you look at the palette, we helped create the Node.js Foundation. Right? Node is what? Everyone know Node? Right? JavaScript is tied with Java as the number one programming language. Right? Node was, for the most part, single vendor controlled. Right? Very hard to have contributions. And we teamed up with Joyent and a bunch of others and moved it into the Linux Foundation to create an open ecosystem for JavaScript development for server-side Java, which, by the way, really matters because of what? Your 12-year-olds are writing your transition systems. <laughs> so it matters. It matters. Okay? So that's an important point here. Uh, so as you use this open source technology, it's important that you give back in some way. It doesn't have to be code. It could be in use cases. It could be in, in uh, bug reports, whatever, right? But it is all really important that you do that. OK. So let me transition now from the artist to Manny. Oh, very good, the connoisseur. How much time do I have? Five minutes. All right, I'm, I'm right on track. Mark, you OK? OK, because Mark's coming up next. Um, let me talk about the connoisseur for a moment. You know, when you have the discussion with your, your business colleagues, and you kind of make the case to them, like, hey, you know what? I'm an artist. I want to build my applications. But I need an infrastructure that matters. I need an infrastructure that scales. I need this palette of, of colors and open source technology to build my stuff. And they look at you, and they're like, man, you need a lot. Right? You're just a developer. You, know? You're just, you just run operations. What is this OpenStack stuff? Right? You need to be able to explain to them what you can do. Right? You need to be able to explain to them that the world, that the applications, applications are not islands. You need to be able to configure and reconfigure and recompose your business processes. Right? An insurance process can change. Lots of many different partners who come in and out of the scheme. It is a very competitive world. And that is how we need to communicate to them and why this matters. And all of the work that we're doing in open source and all of these standards and open technologies around APIs and microservices and, and event-driven architectures and containers and all these things that you can do on, on System Z and that can scale, right, allows them to, to do that. All right? It allows them to deliver their application more quickly. Because in their minds, right, speed and iteration equals a Benjamin. Money. <laughs> okay? It equals a money to them. Right? So that is how we need to have the dialogue with them. And that is, how, that is why when you leverage a technology like Linux One, when you're using Ubuntu, when you are abstracting your code okay, into composable units, let's say with charms, right? you have the ability to compose and recompose and build and rebuild quickly. And what do you do? Right? You deliver value to your business partner. To the Manny Connoisseur. Thank you. I'm not going to call him out twice. <laughs> He'll get it later. He's texting. Well, you know, I forced him to tweet, so that's, I understand. Um, by the way, follow me. Angel Lewis Diaz on Twitter, hashtag need more followers. I used to call it pound, and they're like, no, it's not pound, it's hashtag. I'm like, I'm like okay, I'm a little old, All right? Anyway, um, I lost my train of thought. So, okay, so now, so that's how you communicate. That's why Linux One matters. That's why Ubuntu matters. That's why this abstraction of technology matters. Holy cow. So, now I feel exposed. Um, now I don't feel exposed. Um, before I hand it off to, to Mark, um, and, and Keyshawn will get into this in more detail, but OpenStack, 
just like any other palette of technology that you can do on System Z. OpenStack runs on System Z. You can manage your KVM environments, your, your hypervisors on System Z with OpenStack. We have drivers. It just works. It's part of our family, okay? And we've been doing this for years, okay? So if you've got a System Z in-house, use it, right? You want to learn about Linux One? There's a beautiful one on the, on the floor there. Manny and I are going to steal it later tonight. We're going to take it out for a ride. We're going to drive that thing around, okay? Check it out, because I'm sure a lot of you have that already. Now, I want to introduce our next speaker, who I'm very privileged to, to, to bring here, the founder of Canonical, Mark. And, you know, Mark and I go way back. We've spent a lot of time working together in open source technology. We spent lots of many hours debating technology and, art, and, and the art form, which is, I think, a healthy thing to do. And we have worked together on, on uh, so, many, so many things, OpenStack being one of the many things that we've worked together on. But what is most amazing about Mark is that he's a beekeeper. And I am scared of bees. <laughs> bees scare me. I just take off running. And, uh, and uh, Mark uh, is not a Minecraft player. I am. Well, I, I play video games in general, all video games. But what is most amazing is that uh, Minecraft, uh, there's a woman from Stanford, she writes uh, the beekeeper mod for Minecraft, which is really, really sophisticated. So Mark, after this, we're gonna sit down. I'm gonna show you that mod. So you can help me right, understand, because I don't know everything about bees, but I can handle bees in Minecraft. So with that, Mark, can you please tell us more? Angel, thank you very much. What a treat to be here. And I want to continue the artistic analogy because the great privilege for me in this industry is to think about what artists are trying to achieve, what new tools they want in their palette, what new sources of friction and frustration we can clear out of the way so that brilliant people can do brilliant things. Um, you know, it's an enormous privilege for me when I read about um, the growth inside Waze, which is all built on Ubuntu, or Netflix, which is built on Ubuntu. I get a kind of vicarious pleasure from that acceleration, uh, from that the speed at which those guys are able to go. And I know that our role in all of that is pretty simple. Our role is to try and get rid of the friction, the paper cuts, the the frustrations that would make people waste time um, and so that they can do what they want to do and go faster. So the first thing I want to say about the, the slide, which used to be up there, um, is that the story of Ubuntu and Z, or Ubuntu and Linux One, which is the, the Linux-centric version of the mainframe, is really a story about removing friction, right? And the commitment that we've made to artists in the environment where you'll find Linux One and you'll find Z is that there are no wrinkles, there are no paper cuts, there is no friction. If you SSH into Ubuntu on Linux One, for a while you won't realize that you're on Linux One. The things that you would do instinctively will just work. The palette that you would reach for, the tools that you would reach for, will just work. And the fact that we're able to do that is testament to many years of investment uh, in Linux on Z by that community. But our commitment is to essentially deliver that frictionless experience for artists for whom Ubuntu is comfortable. The second thing I want to talk about is another kind of friction, which is economic friction. Right? What we love about the cloud is elasticity, the ability to, um, to grow and to understand that when we grow, we can, we, can, we can balance both new opportunities, new revenue, with new costs. Right? This economic story is really quite elegant. And that's a story that I think IBM has been telling for a long time on Z and on Linux One with on-demand computing. Um, but there has always been there have always been traditional or additional layers of friction right, in that world. And the challenge we had when we, when we started thinking about Ubuntu in the Z world was how could we play a role in getting rid of economic friction uh, that might slow down 
the consumption of this really quite extraordinary platform. And so the way we've done that is to say, look, we will charge one flat price, which is the same essentially as the list price that you might traditionally have paid for a single VM, to turn on Ubuntu for the entire subsystem in that mainframe. And so what that means is that you can consume additional resources without friction. There is a zero cost to any additional Ubuntu VMs or LPARs or IFLs or containers in that environment. And so this is another kind of friction that we've, we've focused on removing. And I think that's really important because it essentially allows people to start to think of this substrate as an extraordinary cloud, right? Which is the third piece. How do you get access to these extraordinary environments, right? There's no question of the fact that, that the that Linux One and Z environments are incredible from a IO throughput capacity point of view. But how do you get access to that? How do you target that as a developer? Well, it turns out today, you target that through OpenStack, right? And so what are we really shaping? We're shaping a world where you are able to operate with exactly the same artists using exactly the same tools. Your dev and test happens in the right place. Your production happens in the right place. Your data lives in the right place. Using OpenStack as the API means that you're targeting a mainframe as if it was just another region in your cloud. You're using all the same credentials, you're using all the same tools, you're calling all the same APIs, but you get that extraordinary performance. We see today public clouds differentiating themselves on aspects of performance, right? And that to me is a very clear signal that the end user community wants to be able to see Cl the cloud world as, a, as, a, as an array of substrates that they can target. They can place the right workload in the right place at the right time at the right price. And, and the spirit of all of this work has been to achieve just exactly that. I hope if you go, go, go have a look at the, uh, at the uh, Linux One machine downstairs and dig into the experience, uh, you'll be quite delighted by what that actually means operationally. Um, so. Are we set for a, give it a little bit of a demo? At any stage, if folks have a question about um, uh, the Ubuntu on Linux One or Ubuntu on Z experience, I'd be super happy to address that. Okay, we're going to try uh, a demo over here. This is going to be a live demo, so we might have to uh, deal with some technology problems. Uh, but we wanted to talk about a retail demo that we've built using uh, an iPhone app. And uh, for the purposes of this uh, demo, uh, I'm going to drive this through my computer over here since uh, we only have one projector and one input. So first and foremost, uh, let me talk about the architecture that we're talking about. From our standpoint, the setting the stage over here, we have a retail demo where you have a shopping list. You're going to go to a grocery store, you have a shopping list of things that you want to be able to go off and do. Now let's go off and make that app a bit smarter by hooking it up to the store's inventory so that when you go to the store, you know right away whether or not you have the necessary items at the store or you don't. And so we're going to demonstrate how this works with some juju charms that are available uh, today. So I'm going to uh, go to the uh, website.
And the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to pick up ZOS Connect. And ZOS Connect is a set of RESTful APIs that we've created that back end a whole bunch of system of record uh, functions that we have on ZOS. So things that exist in our DB2 databases, things that exist potentially in an IMS database, et cetera. A ZOS Connect provides a REST interface uh, to those uh, environments. So that's going to be the first thing that I'm going to add to my canvas. The next thing I want to add to my canvas is a strong loop. And uh, strong loop is our uh, Node.js API management uh, capability. Um, and so therefore, over here, let me bring that up. right here, and I'm going to grab the mobile. I'm going to add that to my canvas. And then, uh, Mark, you want to explain what's going on here? Many people would be familiar with packaging in Ubuntu or packaging in uh, RHEL or Debian. And packages are a great way to get binaries to a system. What they don't address is the operations and the integration of those pieces of software. So Juju charms are a way that the Ubuntu community started, but now these charms are available on Windows and on RHEL, are a way of encapsulating the operations of software around the package. So each of those two charms is essentially code that specifies how you would install that software, how you would scale that software if you wanted to run it across multiple VMs or machines, and also how you'd integrate those two pieces of software. The fact that we can draw that line between the two pieces of software, suggests that the two vendors have done the work to automatically integrate those two pieces. And that's an experience that you can have today on, on Power, on x86, and now on Z, on OpenStack, on SoftLayer, on VMware, and on Bare Metal. And so it enables us to essentially create an operating experience in Linux One, or in uh, Z, which directly mirrors the operating experience that people are looking for, and ultimately to create hybrid experiences between those. Thank you, Mark. So now let me uh, demo what exactly is happening over here uh, on, the, uh, on the iPhone app over here. So first, uh, we have this cognitive retail app that you see on the uh, palette over here that's on the uh, iPhone. Uh, first thing I'm going to do there is to select it, and then I'm going to uh, log into this uh, retail app that we have. So uh, I'm going to type in my username, and then I'm going to type in the password over here. I love Linux One, and lo and behold, this is my shopping list. Now this shopping list, there's nothing special about it, but the fact that we now connect it up to the store's inventory as soon as I walk into the store, if I select on any one of these items, it can tell me right away whether or not these items exist in the store or not. And the reason it's able to do that is because I just flicked um, chocolate cake, for example. It's able to show me that there are 30 quantities of chocolate cake in the store, some at the bakery, some at the, uh, um, at the, at, in the aisle, in the box aisle. And uh, the reason it's able to do that is because as soon as you walked in the store, it was able to recognize what's on your shopping list and what's, uh, what's in the store from a store inventory standpoint and give you that feedback back to that app itself. So that's one aspect of going off and doing something with uh, Linux on Z, uh, Z and the ZOS environment with respect to the data that exists already there. But now let's go off and build an even smarter app. And our thinking over here is, what if your phone could essentially read your mind? And what we're talking about over here is, what about things that you might have forgotten to add to your shopping list? What about things that uh, you've talked about before that might be promotional items that the store wants to promote to you and you're in the store? How can we go about building your retail app to be able to deal with those things? And so what we want to show right now is essentially 
a new architecture, adding on to the stuff that we've talked about before. First and foremost, we want to add the payment history. So things that you purchased before, stored inside of a DB2 database, having access to that. Second part of this is let's go off and start making use of, for example, things that you've tweeted about, things that um, exist in the store itself, for example, iBeacons, essentially a whole bunch of uh, RFIDs in the store itself to be able to tell you uh, where you are in the store. And then all of that gets put into a Mongo database, MongoDB database over here. Um, and then uh, also do some set of analytics with respect to Spark. Now all these technologies I'm talking about, Spark, MongoDB, Strong Loop, all those technologies over here run on Linux One, accessing some of the data that also exists from a DB2 standpoint. So let's go off and build that using some of that uh, Juju technology that Mark was talking about. In the uh, previous iteration, um, we were building out that story piece by piece, selecting the ZOS Connect component, selecting the strong loop, strong loop con component, and then integrating them. But for something more complex, the knowledge of what connects to what is part of the intellectual property, is part of the company's asset. So wouldn't it be useful if you could essentially template that, specify that here's a topology of pieces that go well together. And that's what we're pulling up here. This is a reusable model, effectively, that specifies multiple pieces of software, some that you'll see were used in the previous iteration, but others that are now introdu introducing the, the real-time cognitive and other analytics capabilities. So this is a picture that can be used on different clouds, on different architectures. You could do dev and test with this picture in the exact right place for dev and test. You could deploy this in the exact right place for your data. And you can reuse this model in different environments to, to, to suit the underlying data requirements, regulatory requirements, government's requirements, or performance requirements. Great, thank you. So this was a bundle that we had created of all these various different technologies that we just deployed. And given that, now let's look at the app and how uh, the experience of the app can very well change because of that. So this is again our shopping list. When we walk into the store, first thing that happens is it looked at your previous purchase history and said, you know what? You forgot to put ranch dip on the, on, the, on the list. You always bought ranch dip whenever you bought your potato chips. So it tells you about them. And at the same time, it tells you it's 40% off today. That's the first thing it does. The next thing is because we were using iBeacons, it tells you the most efficient path for you to go off and collect everything on your shopping list. Which aisle you should go down, where to go next, all because of iBeacon technology. Ranch dip happens to be on the same aisle as the potato chip aisle. And then it says, hey Kershaw, there's a promotional item that if you go down 90 feet down this other aisle, you might particularly like that because uh, of something that you had tweeted about. It doesn't say that over here, but what's happening over here is actually taking something that I tweeted about, and it's telling me they're actually having a special on sparkling red wine. And for, most of, for any of you who've gone down to Australia and are wine connoisseurs, know that they love sparkling red wine down in Australia. I had tweeted about that. And this store happens to carry that sparkling red wine. And it happens to be 40% off. And so it's able to go off and promote that to me 
uh, during my shopping experience. And you can just imagine, this is just what's happening in the store itself. But essentially, this can keep on going for additional items that the store itself might not carry in store itself, but may very well have uh, capabilities to be able to go off and promote other things that I may have tweeted about, or because next week happens to be the big game, make sure I order up all my team jerseys because of the party that I'm going to have, or some additional wine promotions because of, again, my tweeting activities. The possibilities are endless over here. Again, because of analytics, because it's able to go off and get feeds from Twitter, because of my previous purchase history. And all of this is really all possible because of microservices. Mark, you want to mention anything about this? Just to, just to wrap up, I, I hope what people have seen is profoundly familiar, but also exciting, right? These are the world's most coherent systems. There are certain kinds of data that belong and will always belong on these systems. Now we can address those systems with the same tools that we use to address any cloud environment, and we can get both the economics and the developer experience lined up so that we can evaluate those environments using the same tools, the same um, uh, business decision-making processes that you would in considering any operational cloud substrate, effectively. For us, it's a real pleasure to bring our developer community to this platform and these environments, and I think it's testament to OpenStack that it presents such a clean, such a clear, such a useful um, uh, set of APIs to consume these resources. Kershaw? Great. Thank you.